What happens when a couple docs walk into a bar and talk nutrition? We're about to find out. The Dr. David Seaman, welcome to the show, my man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Brother, welcome to the bar. What are you having tonight? Well, you know, I usually am a Guinness guy, but I decided to just go off the rails here and score myself a yingling. So I got a yingling and I put and I put it in a Yeti so it's going to stay nice and cold. Safe play. We might get yeah. stuck here a while. Yeah. <laughs> I went old fashioned tonight. Put a little extra sugar in there just for you because I knew you would approve. Appreciate that. <laughs> See, a guy and like you, when, when you shred down, you can have a little sugar once in a while. It's not a big deal. Hey, it's OK. We can lose a few every now and then. It's not the end of the world, you know? Absolutely. One step at a time. Man, I want to announce that this is our first worldwide episode of Two Docs Walk Into a Bar. And who better to kick off that with than the multi-time Harvard-cited nutrition expert, David Seaman? How's it going? Going good. Yeah, it was uh, three times. So, so to be fair, three times. It was Harvard three times, yeah. That's awesome. Man, do you, I don't think I ever told you this. The first time that I was introduced to you was first year Cairo school. Someone passed me a thumb drive and they said, Hey, there's a lecture on here. You have to hear it. It felt super shady. So I said, okay, I'll do this. And back then we didn't have laptops a ton in school. So I go home, I plug it in and I'm listening to this and it's a neurology lecture that was incredible. And instantly we were engaged and it was way more fun than one of the classes we were sitting in at the time. So we were in, and little did we know about six months later, you scheduled to come speak in St. Louis. So instantly we were there, and it was a dense weekend of the literature as, around nutrition. And what was so profound at that time is that you were speaking on topics related to um, what would be considered to some a modified Atkins style diet, which is now a paleo style diet in that realm calling it anti-inflammatory. And I can't wait to get to that stuff in a little bit, but it was a very dense uh, read. And that was 2007. And with the number of citations and the amount of work you'd put into it, that wasn't a new thing for you. That was not a new topic you were getting into. You'd been speaking about this forever. And I remember getting into practice and it was still not a, a popular thing topic wise. But then now we look at just how time changes over time, just at the end of last year, the American Diabetes Association came out in their updated guidelines and had listed low carb as a very uh, valuable option in making big lifestyle change. And so that's one of the things that has always resonated. You were just so early in being able to present that information and using it from the biochemistry uh, perspective and just looking at it from that scientific perspective. And it's always been so impressive uh, to hear you speak. So I really, really thank you for being uh, the first worldwide presenter <laughs> on the show. I will say I, when, when, when it comes to that topic, I got kind of lucky because, you know, you fall into stuff. And if your brain is ready and you fall into something good, you can just go with it. And that's what happened with me with this whole inflammation thing. It was actually started in 1987. I fell into it. Man. So take me through that a little bit. If When you say 1987, you started hearing about this. And one of the things I'd like you to do is explain this a little bit. When Because now this is not a, a hidden term anymore. People hear this all the time, whether it's on a popular news show, or if they've heard a friend talk about it, if they've ever heard about paleo, they've heard about low carb, or they've heard about um, inflammation being an issue in their health. What, can you take me through maybe a couple things? If I'm an individual listening to this, and I've heard of that, but I don't really know what that is. Could you explain that a little bit or maybe how I would know that maybe I'm dealing with that? Sure. So if you think about in inflammation, the average person, they hear about it. And if, they, if they're in pain, they, they'll, they'll take an anti-inflammatory drug because there's inflammation somewhere. So if you sprain your ankle, it swells up. That's what we see as inflammation. And if you think about the treatment of, of back pain, very... Very rarely do you have people with, who, who have back pain who have swollen areas that you feel that are swollen. And so the idea that there can be inflammation where there's no swelling doesn't really work in the mind, unfortunately, because no matter what, what healthcare school you go to, whether it be Cairo, PT, MD, DO, whoever, acupuncturist, 
when they teach inflammation, they teach it about like the big swelling event that takes place. So what most people suffer from is a low grade inflammation. So when you have pain anywhere, the only way that the, the, the pain nerves are called nociceptors, the only way they can get turned on is by being hit with inflammatory chemicals. So really what it boils down to is that we all have basically, like say, so this would be the window of where your inflammatory chemicals should be. If you go above it, then you may have no swelling but severe pain. You have to go way higher to actually have swelling. So most people cross the threshold. I'll give you an example. A lot of people who are listening, so a lot of the patients listening probably have had a blood test and they, and they, and they had what's called C-reactive protein measured. So it's called CRP for short. It is, you can get a very, a very high sensitivity measurement for CRP now compared to the old days. And normal is below one. You're slightly flamed, mildly flamed if you're between one and three. And you are highly inflamed without swelling if you're above three. So imagine taking healthy 30-year-olds who are fit and healthy, and all their CRP is below one. They eat their exact same diet, their exact same lifestyle. They change nothing, but they only sleep four hours a night for 10 days. For some people, their CRP will go from below one to above four. That is scary flamey. And that's why people feel terrible if they don't sleep enough because the flame goes on, but no swelling. You just increase the amount of inflammatory chemicals that are being produced. So this is actually a good time to name an inflammatory chemical family because if you people have watched the news, they may have heard, and it's been in, in media, you know, uh, uh, news shows where they're talking, and then also print media, where the whole COVID-19 problem where people die is because they suffer from what's called a cytokine storm. And so cytokines are just proteins that are, that are released in excess when the human body is stressed. And the stress could be not sleeping, worrying about who knows what is worrying you or anybody else, but we're all bothered by different things, sedentary living, and then overeating calories, cigarettes, smoking, those things all jack up the flame. So they will increase the production of cytokines, which are these pro-inflammatory proteins. So they turn on and they're released whenever human cells are stressed. And it's not okay. just immune cells. Muscle cells release inflammatory cytokines too. Yep, so pump the brakes on that for a second. So yep. first thing it sounds, to summarize a little bit of what you're saying. So you're as an individual, you can have inflammation levels creeping up in your body and they may be to a point where on, say, a blood test, we can see that they're increasing. But what would be something that how would we know that that's occurring? What's a marker that an individual other than blood work, which we've had a couple of great physicians on recently that talked about how important it is to get your physical, to get that blood work, to be able to check those factors. But if you haven't got that yet, is there a, a way at home that we could easily sign yeah. ourselves up and say, what, what's, what would, how would I know if I'm inflamed? It's so easy, actually, but it works better for women because you know how women, they say, you know, the guy needs to tell me more about how he feels, right? You know, the guy's, rah, 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 rah. okay. So, so, so a woman, a husband and a wife go into their, their physician's office and the physician is intelligent. He understands this key question that will identify how flamed up somebody is. And so they ask, they ask the wife, rate your health. Are you in excellent health? very good health, good health, fair health, or poor health. Whatever that woman picks, whatever that woman picks, her inflammatory markers will correlate to where she chooses. Hmm. If she says, yeah, if she says excellent, then her inflammatory markers will be well with the normal limits. If hmm. she says poor, the flame is on. Wow. So guys, as you know, when they come in to see a doctor, you ask, them, so, so why are you here? Well, my wife made me come in. You've heard that before, right? Absolutely. Every, yeah. Every week. And every week. And, and most of your patients, I mean, typically 60% or more patients are women because women are like, I feel like crap. I got to go to the doctor. Feeling like crap means you're flaming. How easy mm -hmm. is that? That is yeah. easy. That's so, totally easy. 
Man, that's great. We had uh, a physician on a couple weeks ago and we were talking about metabolic syndrome because that's been getting on news shows more frequently. People are hearing about it, that there are these five factors that can happen. And the way he explained it is that they predict bad things. So we could have metabolic syndrome and that that steps into this. How How does that play into... And so basically, if we can get some blood work done, if we can look at some of our waste ratio factors, if we can look at um, some other things as far as um, body mass index, if we can look at some of these factors, and then and how does that play in with the inflammation piece? So if we're a female, we could say, all right, I feel crappy. I, I just don't feel my best. Then there's a that correlates based on some of the information that you're aware of that that is an inflamed individual. For a male, if their wife is upset with them, sending them in, that's probably a good marker. But what are some yeah. other assets or self-screens that we could perform? Well, you just mentioned there the metabolic syndrome. There are, so there are five. And so one of them is waist circumference and blood pressure. If, now, it's kind of amazing. So, so, so the average guy, uh, when he's, say, and m- most males reach their adult, mature, proper body weight before the age of 25. Between, I mean, most guys, you know, at the end of college, around 22, 25, that's kind of where guys peak, where they're, they're, they're not going to get any more muscle mass. If they get any bigger, it's body fat. So for, the mo- for most guys, it's like call 22. Now, women mature earlier than men. They reach their, their, their adult proper weight for their life between the age of 16 and 20. Hmm. Right? So, so why do you think about that is? Why do you think uh, women hit that so much earlier than men? I think it has to do with species perpetuation. Because if you're thinking about about short, I mean, imagine right now, I mean, we're sitting here uh, relaxing in nice homes, right? You know, talking to who knows how many people. Life's pretty easy. Now, let's take one living, say, in uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. Very cold. It's still snowing almost in Sault Ste. Marie up there uh, in, in Lake Superior. Imagine having to live outdoors. Mm. I mean, that life is so tough, right? So in order to perpetuate the species, you have to be fully matured early so you can pop out kids because, I mean, you could die. in sure. the in, Yeah, so, so I think that is the reason why. Mm. So, so growth after 22 for a man, typically not the ideal strategy to occur. That's what I'm hearing. Unless you can get your muscles jacked up, otherwise it's the waist girth that that goes. So most guys, uh, if you ask them what their what their waistline was when they were say 22, 20, when they were the fittest and felt the best of their life, most guys will say 32, 31. Mm. Got it. Got it. Most guys, 30, yeah. right? So so historically, even like the the, the ideal male physique for for you know, classic models, we have a 30-inch waist and a 40-inch chest. Right. So you go up a little bit higher and women, you know, 36, 24, 36 as the stereotypical version. So if you take a 24 or 25 inch waist, which is normal for women when they're 18, 20. Well, historically now childhood obesity is massive. So that has changed a lot. So one of the metabolic syndrome markers is a waist circumference for men above 40 inches. That gives you like eight inches of leeway right before you're fully flaming. Yeah. But the second, but the, the second a guy goes above thirty three, subtle flame starts to tick up. Got it. For women, the the, the second a woman goes above twenty eight, then subtle inflammation can start to tick up. Now it may be nothing long term unless they start stop sleeping, massive stressors, lose job, divorce, deaths of family, just catastrophic psychosocial issues. Then that will just brutally flame them up. But you just slowly but surely tick up the flame. So metabolic syndrome for men is above 40 inches. Now again, so therefore 39 and a half isn't a victory, Mm, right? That's an important point. Yeah, you can't go, hey, I'm 39, I'm doing great. No, no, big boy, you're really close. (laughs) You're off the cliff, the cliff is right there, Yeah. right? So for women, it's 35 inches, 35, oh wait, sorry, 28 inches for women is, is high normal where you want to get any higher than that. And so the metabolic syndrome marker for women is 35 inches. Mm. Or, and that's right around the belly button umbilicus or an inch above or an inch below. So how do you feel? And so guys, if, if a guy feels safe and like, dude, I mean, you look terrible. How do you feel? I feel like crap. 
okay, thank you very much. So your, your health is fair, not good. So you know he's flaming. You do his waistline, he's a 42, flame is on. You do his blood pressure, 140 over 90, flame is on. So he's got two metabolic syndrome markers. There are three more, and one is gonna be low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, and high blood glucose, which you have to measure. But if you have those two, blood pressure up, and it's only 130 over 85, you gotta be above that to be metabolic syndromey. So just those two, plus how you feel, flame is on. You can even say, if you don't get six hours a night sleep, flame is probably on, unless you're just a big outlier, because most people need at least six. Six to nine is the normal range for the average person. If one is sleeps 10 hours in a night, they tend to be more flamey than if they slept eight hours. If you sleep five hours or five and a half hours, more flamey than if you got six or more. So to summarize a little bit of that, you talked about if our waist circumference gets out of whack, if we see that we're moving towards those factors you just discussed about metabolic syndrome, if we're getting closer to those, if and one of those obviously is going to be weight gain in there. So those things are creeping up and that leads to more inflammation, which you said starts to make you feel like crap. You don't feel your best and you notice that's coming. Talk a little bit about um, what happens here. You talked about how his sleep's affecting us, then, then we're out, that, that all these things are going to start to lead to that inflammation. All of these things, you brought up weight gain, not good. Shitty sleep, not good. This That's something that everyone knows, right? I, I would say almost everyone knows. But like you brought up a little bit earlier, is that we're seeing diabetes on the rise. E even last year in that same publication I was talking about, they talked about how now one in three people are pre-diabetic and don't even know it as an adult. So the reality is this stuff keeps going up. But it's not necessarily for a lack of you need good sleep and you don't need to have excess weight. So if it's not a lack of facts on that part of it, what is it? It's a behavioral issue, hmm. unfortunately. So, so habits are difficult to break. So, so you just shredded 30 pounds. Why did you do that? I desperately needed to because I put on 10 really fast when COVID started. The stress of the scenario... The guidelines changing every three to six hours, We're having to change, publish new things for our clinic on how are we going to maintain operating, helping uh, emergent cases, slept a whole lot less. And man, I learned to make some killer pizza. We got, I mean, it was a, a great time. I enjoyed every one of those pizzas though. Brick oven, hot, 900 degrees, got it down and it was fun every time. It's just fun a little bit in the morning too. But the reality is 10 pounds came on really fast, felt completely shitty and said, something's got to change. Catalyst was, I've got to make it happen now. So that's my personal anecdote of exactly so, what happened. So something had a switch in your mind, right? There had to be a switch in, in your mind. So I just happened to have one of my books here, right here. This is my brother. Can you see that real close there? That's yeah. my brother who's, I'm 60, he's 50, he was 340 pounds then. And then he became this guy in less than a year. And he gained that weight because he developed really bad cer uh, cervical dys dystonia. Mm. And so he went from 190, great athlete, to chronically disabled, chronic pain, miserable, not, not suicidal, but it's kind of like, what's the point of living when, you, when your life sucks that, that bad? So he decided, well, you know, Look at me, I weigh 150 pounds more. He shredded back the one, he shredded 190 pounds off, whatever it was. And it was 190 pounds, 150 pounds off. And he then wrote a book about dystonia. And now he, and, and he's been invited by, by, by actually I think uh, at Vanderbilt, there's a, a big dystonia guy at Vanderbilt that my brother was in, was in touch with at one point. So he's spoken at dystonia meetings. So, he's, so, so you have to have something in your mind that, that you see as a goal and then you tag healthy lifestyle choices with that goal. Otherwise, it's impossible. And in general, it's, you know, it, it can be a vain pursuit. Like, let's just say, hey, you know, you're going to be in a movie. You got you to shred 50. You do it in a heartbeat. I mean, think about that, right? You do it in a heartbeat. So you have to find something in your mind that is, that's going to propel you to be that guy. Now, for me personally, so I'm finishing year 60 in like five weeks, right? Freaking 60. Got to be kidding me. Well... So my father's 85 and he shot an 80 today on the golf course. 
Attaboy. Right. Yeah. My father weighs basically what he weighed when he was in college. Wow. Yeah. And so, so if you want to have a long life that doesn't suck, or if bad stuff happens to you, you don't want to be flamed up because then, because then it gets worse and it gets really bad. And so we have this war that goes on when it comes to food that tastes really good, that's heavy in calories, that is the enemy that we have to learn how to control. And so there's no way around it. You just have to just develop a mindset. You have to be mindful. So, you know, this whole, this whole idea about watch what you eat. I mean, what a dumb thing to say. I'm washing. Look at that donut. Here it comes and it's gone. I washed it. Is that good? I'll wash another one right now. I'll keep washing and go in. So that's so you have to be mindful and go, wait, I should only have one of those. Yeah. I should only have one or two old fashions with extra sugar or a mojito with extra sugar, whatever it is. Not I like you said two. I'm a big fan that you just said two right now. Yeah. 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 Big fan. Yeah. So and so the other thing too is that when people decide to make that make that change, they oftentimes dramatize it to the point where making the change is so stressful. Right. Like yeah. like in my book, it's I, I say if, if you're gonna drink, have red wine and stout beer because they're the most anti-inflammatory. It doesn't mean you cannot have, you know, a Coors Light or a Yingling. It just means that that's the best option. And so, so we, we, we take all these healthy ideas and then we have target goals for waist circumference. So if you're a 42 inch guy, then you want to first get below 40. Like you notice my, my so, so I'm the oldest of four, uh, 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago. Now our, parents 50th wedding anniversary and the, the four kids had a picture us and so my brother calls me he goes dude i'm the fat guy i don't want to be the fat guy T- you know tom was uh was like 340 or 350 and jeff felt like he was kind of shredded at 230 and then tom goes down to, down to 190 and jeff's like i'm the fat guy you know what do i do i go all, all you gotta do is just stop eating jelly beans and donuts and everything else and make it a goal so i said well what would your ideal weight be? He goes, I'd like to be 200. I go, I go, what did you weigh when you were in the best shape of your life after you got out of boot camp for the Navy? He goes, I was like 165. I go, that's probably your proper adult weight unless you have more muscle mass. Like, I can never get that low because that's like 60 pounds. So I didn't say you should make that your goal because that'd be too stressful for him. And he just couldn't conceptualize. So I said, well, you got to choose your goal. So he chose 200 pounds. He got down to 200 pounds in like a couple months. He goes, I'm like 195 now. Because I'm going for 185. Like, good for you. And so he got down to 165. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. I love what yeah. you said there, too, about the goal setting. Because we had Dr. Scott Jordan on, and he said almost the exact same thing in his chart. He never puts a weight for someone in their uh, in their head. They He asks them what seems like a reasonable goal because it has to feel attainable. And I thought that was a really, really strong point that you just made. And we've had about a million comments jump in here real quick. Ton of uh, David Seaman fans, which is awesome always to see. Uh, Dr. Holly Tucker said she saw you 10 years ago. Jared Van Ann uh, jumped in. But we had a really good question I wanted to answer, have you answer right away because it's right on online with the same line of thinking. Um, and also uh, wanted to talk about here, Alec asked, if you're a young person and you say you have a really high metabolism and they feel like they can just eat everything, does any of this even matter? Well, it does matter because you can take really healthy people. Now, let's just take, say like Michael Phelps, for example, the best example of a young guy who won like, what, 10 gold medals or something like that, two in a row, Olympics, whatever it was, right? The guy would like eat 10,000 calories per day, right? <laughs> Ten, and he was the fastest swimmer I've ever in history. I, I, we'll, we'll just call it that because I haven't thought of Olympic swimming. So he ate not great food, but was, I mean, not bad food all the time, but just he had pound calories, pizzas and this and that and whatever else it was, uh, waffles and on and on and on. So it didn't hurt him in that moment. But I can tell you, though, if you take the leanest, healthiest person that who, who is listening now or that the leanest, leanest, healthiest person that any of us who are on this podcast thing right now know, and we give them a thousand calories of donuts, there will be a measurable uptick in inflammation within one hour, but no symptoms. The only feeling you have is I'd like some more, right? That's so 
that is that is the problem with youth. You're very resilient. I'll give you an example where where this becomes really really bad as you age. So uh, I had lunch. I guess I was probably this guy's probably early fifties. I was I was late late forties, mid late forties, I guess. So we so so we go to this uh, this chicken wing place, and I got the naked wings that were baked. Caesar salad, no croutons, very light dressing, you know, and and an iced tea, you know, unsweet. That just reeks of a David Seaman order. I mean, that's right, a, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. The epitome. Yeah. So, so this guy gets the the thing of curly fries, you know, double double fried chicken wings, you know, sweet tea. I mean, just the whole nine yards, right? Everybody's so, dying in the comments because I put a meme up a second ago, and that's my order. That's what I get. So, so he orders this, and we're driving back to work, and, and there are three of us in the car. And he says, you know, every time I, every time we go there, you know, by the time I'm like, I can feel my hands just like getting stiff and tight. And I'm like, every time? <laughs> I mean, this is like, wasn't like the first time. This is like every, he goes, every time I go, why do you keep doing it? And he's like, what do you mean? I go, you're a chiropractor and you're like this. It didn't occur to you not to want to be like this. So my point is that is how powerful the dietary crack brain is. So you don't want to feed, let the dietary crack brain run your life because after you pass the early 20s and get into your 30s and older, your life will fall apart by living on those foods. I mean, imagine them. I mean, I can go eat uh, deep fried chicken wings and French fries and have no symptoms. But that was pretty good because I haven't been flaming my whole life. But this guy, when we were driving back to work, and it was only 15 minutes. He already felt it coming on to him. Hmm. Who wants to be like that? Like, yeah, so the I, good. Yeah, I, I'm dead on with you. So it, the reality is in the moment, logically, no one wants that. Right? I've never met somebody that says, you know, it'd be really awesome today, David, if I was just so stiff after I smashed some onion rings. So no yeah. one goes into it with that when they're full or they're away from it logically or having a moment of clarity or lucency. They, they have that moment where they're like this. I know this got to change. If they use your guideline, like you said, look back to their healthiest weight in that time span. They're like, look, I'm over that. I don't have youth on my side anymore like I did. So emotionally, it sounds like there's a component there that's really hard. There's an addictive component that makes it extremely hard because logically he, the, the individual you spoke of felt miserable. He did not want to do that again, but for some reason that perpetuates itself. Can you speak on that? Because obviously we see that all of the time right. and in the South, that is a, a classic factor. And it's clearly why it's such a big issue in America. This isn't a, a one person problem, right? And and right. everyone's aware of their their weight or their scenario in that reality. They're like, look, I could stand to lose a few. Like they have that feeling and they know that, but then necessarily beating themselves up on it isn't exactly a huge win all the time either if it doesn't lead to action. So I'd love your expert opinion on that. It's very simple. Make your house pure and clean and no pro-inflammatory calories at all. No desserts, no nothing, nothing in your house. If you bring it in your house, it's a one serving event. And I don't mean, you know, a, a gallon of ice cream in one serving. I mean, you go get a little one and bring it home if you want, or just eat it out and keep your house clean. So that if you're gonna eat that crap, then you go out to do it. That's what I do. If I'm gonna eat that crap, I go out and I get it. That's the easiest way to do it because then your domain, so your workplace and your home is not filled with that stuff because everybody wants to eat that stuff. I do. I mean, you gained 10 pounds in the first, I mean, you didn't do the co the, the quarantine 15 as we're calling, you did quarantine 10, but, but why does that happen to everybody? Because when you're stressed out, if that crap is there, you're going to eat it, the weight goes on and it's over. So, you know, my mother will say, I don't want that stuff in my house because if it's there, I'll eat it. Yeah. If it's not there, I won't think about it. And so that's the best way to look. If, if you're an alcoholic, you don't go hang out in bars, right? So Perfect. if you are a food, if you're a foodaholic, which we all are, so most people may not. Well, most people can probably remember some version of this, but I've witnessed it um, 
in, in real life a couple of times and I've seen pictures where, where parents have taken pictures of their two or three year old tasting cake for the first time. And you could like, they're like brain, like, like, what is this? And it's this incredible emotional reaction to, 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 to putting sugar, flour and, and, and fat together and eating it. So that That's reaction, good. right? Yeah. That reaction right there is the reaction that everybody has whenever they think about ice cream. Like, really? Okay. I mean, if I think about ice cream or whatever, there is an Italian pastry uh, shop in town where she's from Italy and she makes the best cannolis like you can ever. And with the best Italian coffee, I haven't been there in like two years. Now, when I think about it, I'm like, I can be right there. I can taste it. Right. Like, I don't I don't have that experience with broccoli. Like, oh, yeah, that bro just that broccoli, man. I mean, it's. It's so incredible. I mean, when you just have a piece of that lettuce you can chew on, it's just so... Un <laughs> Brother, that right? is it. Like, if yeah. I have a bowl of broccoli, I'm instantly questioning, like, how did I get here? Yeah. What happened? What mistake what did this? I make to where I'm having a bowl of broccoli? I can't have something else? Yeah, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. And, and think, so, so how much better do you feel now since you knocked off 30 pounds? Yeah. It is a uh, dramatic difference. There's no question about it. Um, Do you hurt any less? Did, did you have any aches and pains or lethargy, fatigue? Yeah, so actually I did. I had a lot, and that is was one of the catalysts as well. It just had an injury, wasn't doing too well with it, wasn't coping well. COVID was also happening. It was like, this is ridiculous. So that yeah, was the catalyst. Go. And I think that that's where, uh, when we had an interview with another doc earlier, I can't remember if it was on camera or just before, but he said something that resonated with what you just said, it popped into my head. And it was for a lot of people, the hardest part is, is that there has to be a moment where the pain of staying the same is worse than the pain to change. Yeah. And that resonated really well with exactly what you just said, because it reminded me that's exactly where I was at. It was like, this is ridiculous. This has got it. Can't keep doing this. Wife's not happy with this. So we got to yeah. make a change. And so for but, me, so, so for me, after hitting 60 this year, or finishing six, you know, year sixty. So I start, I start year sixty one in like six weeks, five weeks. I'm like sixty one, what the hell happened? And so I think to myself, well, I mean, if I'm honest, I have ten to thirty years left. I mean, if I'm really unlucky, I got ten. If I'm, if I'm fortunate, I got thirty. What do I want those years to be like? So uh, I started playing golf again, and during the COVID thing, I wasn't traveling at all. So I played like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like every Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I see the tan. It's real. Yeah, man. You've been oh, out yeah. there, baby. Yeah. But my deal with myself is unless I'm playing in some like skins game where you got to get a cart, uh, I only walk. So mm -hmm. that's my rule. I will, I will not play golf for the sake of playing golf. I will play golf to make it a walking event. And by the way, my handicap went from like an 11 to a seven. So it wasn't bad. It's a lot more fun. It's yeah, a now lot it's more eight, fun. But it was, yeah, yeah. It's a lot, I'll tell you, it's a lot more fun shooting close to par at times. Yeah. So my goal is to shoot my age, like my dad. And I can't be awesome. one of my, you know, and I play with my father when, when I go visit them, and, and, and the age range is like 75 to 90. Mm -hmm. And you see the guys, are, there are two really fit 90 year old guys who are just like mentally fit. They're just like, they're just great to talk to versus. I mean, okay, but they're just, they can probably move these guys. They can't hear. They take forever. And, this, and, these, and these other guys who are nine, they're just moving around real quick. So I'm like, I don't want to be one of those guys. Yeah. And yeah, so the obesity factor in a golf cart, you can still hit a golf ball, but you can still die in two months of cancer or, or heart disease or whatever it is. So I'm looking at that, like, how do I want to be? So you have to project out into the future. It's very difficult when you're young and stressed out to like think like that. You have to, but you need to, because you need to look at, People out there who are healthy and not healthy or who, whose lives are working for them and, and they're out there playing golf and surfing and tennis and softball. I mean, there are guys who are playing like the super senior softball leagues, right? And I see a lot of these guys, not those guys, but they're in wheelchairs uh, or scooters going through Sam's Club because they came and walk, much less play softball, right? Yeah. So you have to target a goal and, and just make that your focus. And if you fall off the wagon... You have your markers like waist circumference, waist of ratio, blood pressure, blood sugar, all those things, and just force them to be, get them to the normal range. 
so that your fasting glucose, triglycerides, HDL, all that stuff is proper. CRP is proper. And then, and then now you determine what your donut threshold is to keep all your markers normal and never let your markers get beyond uh, the anti-inflammatory domain, which means you can still have that stuff, but you do it in a measured fashion. It's controlled. You're, you, you're, you're very mindful about it. And then you don't even care anymore. Like, I don't care that I don't have donuts in my, I could care less. <laughs> Although there is a donut shop nearby where they have this really awesome bacon maple donuts. And I had one last week. It's really good. It's amazing. <laughs> if you ever it's come amazing. to a course in Daytona, I'll take you there. Oh, uh, we'll, <laughs> like we'll, we'll race to see if you can smash it quicker. <laughs> we had a question come in about this exact yeah. topic about, uh, this is from Alec in the comments. He said, you know, what are some tips? Because a couple things you just said were dead on with this idea of emotional eating. So there's an emotional component and emotional eating is really challenging for a lot of people, right? It's some way to cope. Maybe they don't have another outlet at that time. There's not a, a way to handle it. So they choose food because like you said, we're all food addicts deep down because we have to have food to survive. That's a little bit different than some right. of the other addictions out there. Right. But what are some strategies if emotional eating is a big problem in your life? Well, one has to spend a lot of their day in general examining the, the situations that they are in and the reactions that they are having. So they get so 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 it's about to, it's, the, the term is mindfulness. If you have no mindfulness, you'll just be shoving food in your ha- in your mouth all day long. So you have to work on mindfulness. Choose your goals. Things that are important to you. So for you, you didn't want to be in pain anymore. You wanted to move better. You wanted to be able to like do all those exercises that you show patients like a superstar as opposed to a, a potentially almost obese guy with metabolic syndrome, which could have happened in five, you know, five years. So, you, so, 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 so now you're like, okay, I want to be that guy. And so now you're mindful. Like my brother who went from 340 down to, down to, one, to 190, he is so mindful. It's ridiculous. Every time... It's, it's time to eat. He's like, okay, I'm doing this. And it's not like, oh, I'm going to just shove that in my face because he doesn't have any of that in his house anyway. There's no way around it. it it's, I mean, I would say ultimately, I mean, this, I made. I wanted to, to, to make this a, a free Kindle book. It's 99 cents for Kindle. And so, so it's like 13 bucks hard copy. But this whole book is about mindfulness in many ways. It's about, it's about mindfulness in a certain area and then all the different things you need to be mindful about. Nice. And so, yeah, so you can just go right to Amazon, look through, look through the p- table of contents, and you'll see all the things that drive us to pig out. There's a primordial drive, which is you need food to live. So there's this primordial drive, and then there is a stress induction. So when you get stressed out, you have to have a better strategy for dealing with stress. Like if you, if you feel stressed out, there's no reason why you can't, in a cubicle at work, Move your chair back and then and then quietly do 50 squats with no weight or 20. Something to get your mind off of the stressor. And then you start doing it. Okay. And you feel better. And then the feeling better will give you power over the emotional drive to shove crap in your face. Yeah. A lot of people work in, in situations where crap is there because that's just how it is. And they can't control that. So they have to create strategies for themselves to control. And physical activity is one of the biggest things. But there needs to be this constant mental vigilance. There's no, you, can, you cannot be mentally lazy and expect to, 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 to eat properly and stay deflamed. So when that starts out, and that is really challenging, it's hard to make that right decision. Can you get better and better at doing that? Or is that something that either you just have it or you don't? No, not anyone can do it. Again, if you, Jason, you have to lose 50 pounds and you can be in the next blockbuster movie. Wait, 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 ha, done. Done. Yeah. So the motive, there has to be a motivation and yeah. something that helps you build that step one step at a time towards that success. We had another yes. great question come in. Blair had asked, is there a difference though between men and women of a similar age? For example, her statement was that there for her, it's a little bit harder for her to lose weight, but it seems like if her fiance decides that he wants to make the change, it's a blink of an eye and he can drop the weight back off. No, it's, it's, it's really, it's really, it's the, I, mean, I would say it's, it's almost identical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just that 
women had, for some reason, out into the, 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 the information world, there is this myth that as women age, it's more difficult for them to maintain proper body weight. If that's the case, then how come Japanese women in Japan weigh what they weigh at 70, the same weight that they weigh when they're 50, 40, 30, and 20? That's powerful. That being the case, that's it. Clay, case closed. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, that's if you amazing. Go, yeah, if you go down to the South Sea Islands, and this, this area is called Katava, it's in New Guinea, they have pictures of people who are very young and then very, very old, men and women, you know, they're more robust when they're, when they're in their 30s and 40s and 20s. And when they get old, they become more frail. The women aren't fat, they're frail. The men aren't fat, they're frail. So this is all just an excuse that has been put into our brains. Hmm. It's not true. It is true if you actually have a true metabolic disorder. Like everyone says, well, I can't lose weight because I got a thyroid problem. And I'm like, sure. I mean, do you have Hashimoto's? I mean, do you, do you really have one? Oh, my metabolism is just as slow. It's not slow. You're sitting around not doing anything and thinking about donuts. You got to get over it. It's just, it's just, you got to just slap yourself around and get over it, basically. So the hard part is to bring this back because somebody just asked a good question about uh, the heart of inflammation and weight gain are the same thing. And they were asking a question about if we have, explain this a little bit. So if I am an individual, weight's going up, okay? Uh, there's a lot of family members that that we have that are, are managed for diabetes, et cetera. And the inflammation isn't exactly the topic that's ever talked about. Insulin resistance is talked about a whole lot. Blood sugar and just sugar levels in general are talked about a lot. Um, I would love for you to speak on and clarify this just a little bit. Are we talking about different things, the same thing? But if someone is uh, excessively overweight, and they're at the point where now they have gotten to the diabetic levels. Their A1C is high, right? That's that's verbiage that is pretty common knowledge now in our society. They they know what their A1C is, or at least of their loved ones, they know what their blood sugar is. Um, these are things that they hear about, and it's it's all these things. You know, we'd consider more that endocrine system based information and blood work. But then when we hear you talk, David, it's about inflammation. Can you talk about these two things? Because they're uh, incredibly confusing to a whole lot of people. Sure. So imagine this, this glass cup, Yeti thing, is, is any cell in the human body. Pick your favorite cell. If you dump sugar into that cell, that cell will pump out inflammatory chemicals. Case closed. Every cell is like that, no matter what. And they've identified this in young people. You, you dose up on high refined carbohydrates and you measure inflammatory signaling molecules, they uptick no matter who you are, no matter what your age is, no matter what your health level is. So if, if, if I'm a really young, lean, healthy guy, and my, my glucose is perfecto, and I go have six donuts, I will have a flaming event afterwards. But after, that, after three or four hours, and the, and the glucose is now back to normal, I'm fine. Someone who is hyperglycemic, insulin resistant with high levels of A1C, they are always throwing too much sugar into all of their cells, whether they're eating or not. And so these cells are always pumping out inflammatory chemicals. And it depends upon who you are in terms of your genetics. Like, so you think about your practice. Why do some people get tendinopathy, but they never have actual joint pain? Why would you have joint pain, but never blow a disc? You just have OA, joint pain, whatever it might be, and no tendinopathy. Why would you have none of those but then get osteoporosis, right? So there are genetic issues where, where when we turn the flame on, it, it pushes what they call epigenetic expression. So genetic expression of your potential once you turn the flame on. And it's very different from person to person, which is why I like to not talk about names of diseases. <laughs> because names of diseases screw people. They, well, what do I take for that? Eh you know, stop eating so much calories. And then, I mean, for no matter what one's condition is, if they took like a magnesium supplement, uh, omega-3s, vitamin D, just those three, maybe some ginger and turmeric and got their calories down, replaced all the refined calories with, with anti-inflammatory vegetation, no matter what the name of your condition is, it would probably reverse. Hmm. And so I'm not interested in the names of conditions. In fact, in the book right behind you, there is the, uh, I forget the chapter, but that one there, yeah, I have this one circle that shows all these different diseases. And then the next page, I show the same circle with those diseases 
grayed out so it's very, very faint, so you focus on the flame. And that is what is not taught in really any healthcare situation, because it's like, well, you're reducing everything to inflammation. Well, I'm reducing it to the, 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 the pathology or the pathochemistry that is identical no matter what the name of the disease is, even COVID-19. So it turns out that the way SARS, because it's called SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the coronavirus. So SARS-CoV-2 enters cells via an enzyme that's involved in, uh, in blood pressure regulation. So the reason why obese diabetics are at much greater risk is first because obese chemistry, like the immune profile, so the immune cells, they ship. There's, you can have anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory immune cells, and they should basically be about the same. And then when you need, uh, when you get injured, the flamers go on, and then they turn off, the anti-flamers go on to heal, and then they're back to normal. So when you're obese, the pro-inflammatory immune cells are always overactive in obese, in the obese uh, fat mass. It's actually obese fat cells are viewed by the immune system as if you're infected by a virus. So obesity chemistry is viral chemistry, which is why obese people feel like crap. So you think about yourself before you drop your 30 pounds. You, you, you probably feel well now. And when you look back at yourself 30 pounds, you're probably like, I kind of felt a little unwell compared to how well I feel now. Well, you are living in low-grade viral chemistry. So if you got a big dose of SARS-CoV-2, you could have had a bad COVID-19 outcome or not, or not such a fun one. So it turns out that when you're obese, the obese fat mass is viral chemistry, bad fat mass stuff, immune, immune function. Mm -hmm. then, then the glucose, like A1C you mentioned, A1C is hemoglobin, A1C, as you know. So hemoglobin is a protein. And so hemoglobin A1C is, is a measurement of how much sugar is attached to hemoglobin. So it's called glycosylated or glucose, basically like a gumdrop, packed sugar stuck to it, right? So that's what A1C is. So it turns out that high blood sugar levels are going to attach themselves to hemoglobin. They will also attach themselves to the ACE2 enzyme on lung cells. So you actually get sugar-coated ACE2 enzyme, and that is how SARS-CoV-2 enters and infects cells, by being hyperglycemic because of the sugar-coated enzyme that the virus enters the cells by. Disaster. So, so you can look at, so this person has hyperglycemia, which means that they're flaming, right? They're obesity, they're flaming. So we don't think, well, diabetes here, heart disease there, cancer here, Alzheimer's there, depression. You just think, what are my markers? Get my A1C below 5.7. Get my fasting glucose below 85. I don't care about this, that. I'm just going to get my markers normal, like you did in the last two or three months, and now you're a new you. So right. easy, man. So easy. Yeah. The one thing that you brought up about the A1C that I thought was interesting, and, and you've, I heard you speak about this years ago, and it was almost dead on to what I was just reading the other day. And again, my goal is not to get too in the weeds with the sciencey side, but I think some of these things are, are just talked about so often that they're pretty common to people now. Like A1C, everyone has heard of that, and they know their measurements and where we want to see them, and, and they hear about this, at least with loved ones uh, during their management, et cetera. But one thing that you had talked about is that you can see that that gumdrop-like effect uh, spike up after uh, eating lots of sugary foods or high calories over a long period of time. What was very interesting, we talked a little bit about fasting with one of our previous guests, and it was very interesting that those numbers would drop dramatically after a period of time of fasting. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Fasting? Fasting or just the idea that when we eat or how we space it out, how that affects that sugar level in the body and how that can sometimes be a strategy for individuals. So uh, if you're a, a, a good way for the average person to change how they're eating, if they're really a dietary crackhead who severely just can't stop themselves, they should do time-restricted feeding. So as opposed to uh, eating until they go to bed, they force themselves to stop eating at eight o'clock. And then they don't eat again until at least 10 o'clock well, you want to go at least 13 hours. That's the magic number 
where a 13-hour fast initiates ketone production at, at a higher level. It's just a lot of metabolic fitness for mitochondria and other cellular functions. So the longer you, you protract that, that, that fast between dinner and breakfast is very anti-inflammatory. And so then that's the first thing that you can do if you want. You can still eat the same crap you're eating now, just compress your eating window down to eight to 10 hours, right? And then once you start to feel better, say, so, you know, maybe I'd like to have no more pains and I'd like to be able to like uh, do whatever it is that this person wants to do. Like, see, I want to be walking on the golf course till I'm in my 80s. I can't do that if I live on donuts. So when we withdraw the, the, the really the high calories, like for example, let's like talk about potatoes for a second, just because that's so people think potatoes are bad, there's high sugar, blah, blah, blah. Well, the Irish population was reported to be the most healthy peasant population in Europe. So the English peasants, flour, French peasants, flour. Uh, I know this is not true, but it's, it's been used over time is where Marie Antoinette's like, yeah, let them eat cake. And that's not true, but, and, you know, so they're basically eating cake while their food's rotting, which is part of the reason why the French Revolution took, took place. And during that same time period, all of those peasants were being brutalized. The healthiest peasants were the Irish peasants because they lived on potatoes. So they ate five to eight pounds of white potatoes a day, no diabetes, because they were moving from dawn until dusk every day. Constantly, every day, every day. So, and I know it doesn't exactly answer your question, but fasting is very good. The problem for fasting, though, for the average person is if they can't stop eating donuts and replace those with, say, sweet potatoes, you're going to say, okay, don't eat anything? Mm. That's like impossible for the average person. Gotcha. So, so that's yeah. the barrier then. So the barrier then to time-restricted feeding might be that it seems impossible to go without, say, the latte in the morning or their special coffee in the morning or uh, a breakfast or something like that. That may be too difficult for someone that has been inflaming for a long period or eating foods or excessive calories over a long period of time to maybe cope with other issues. It may be a little too challenging of the first line of defense to go to, I'm not going to eat for X period for perpetuity or just for quite a well, while that may, may, may be too challenging no i would say this i would say a full fast is way too challenging for the average person but okay. doing time restri time restricted feeding anybody can do it nice. nice people people you know people watch like to watch movies that are inspiring about like you know, you're stuck with it and you won right and people are like oh, i want to be like that anybody can be like that now now i i cannot be I can't stick with my golf game and become, as, I'm, I'm not going to ever be a zero handicap, probably. I just, I'm not going to practice enough. I do not care. My goal for, for, for golf is to leave my house, leave my computer, be in green grass, and hopefully sh shoot in the 70s every time. All right, so, so like that's my goal. I'd like to break par. Never broke par. Lowest is 73 a few times. Haven't broken par. I'd like to do that. So, so forget, forget the reason why I went in that direction. So that's the goal thing. So, 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 so you stick with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sticking with, I'm sticking with my plan so I can be like my father and his buddies. Nice. So for, so, so anybody can force themselves to, 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 uh, eat, to stop eating dinner at eight, eight o'clock and then don't eat again until after 9 a.m. And by the way, that's not a shameless, shameless about breast cancer. So this book about breast cancer, they found that, that, that after women had breast cancer and they were treated for it, those who did a, a 13 hour or longer fasting window, they had much less breast cancer resurgence than those who, who, who ate more regularly. So basically you're saying if you can have dinner earlier an initial strategy that could be successful. Have dinner a little earlier, skip breakfast. Yeah. So yeah. that could be a great first step that anybody could do to help take control of their inflammation levels or the overweight state and that just not feeling their best can be a great first step to be a launching pad to get to the goals that they really want to get to. Right. Now, if, now if, if, if they skip, like, let's just say that they eat breakfast every day at 6 a.m., well, do you want to try this like 13 hour deal on say Saturday morning, not on Monday morning? Mm. Because if you're used to it and you, and you, and you basically, cause what people tend to do, the big mistake that people make, okay, I'm going to change my life around 
and they go from eating 3,000 calories per day to eating like 1,000, and they're like freaking out. Well, that's the dumbest, that's a guaranteed way to fail. Yeah. So you just want to get your caloric intake down to what it should be, 2,000, and then, and then do the, and then compress your eating window. Don't have to skip breakfast, just eat later. Nice. Or, you can eat, or you can eat dinner at 10 o'clock at night and then don't eat again until noon or have nice. a snack at 11. And, and, and even though uh, heavy cream and coffee is considered calories, 50 calories is not enough to screw everything up. So you throw that into black coffee and it's no big deal. It's not, it's not like pure, pure fasting, but it's pretty close though. It's not like, wow, I had 50 calories of cream. Now I just, my, 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 I mean, it's not even going to be an insulin driver. It'd be nothing. It's nothing. No, yeah. that is a good point though. That's a really good point. So if you did give uh, uh, some type of calories that are not um, high sugar or get broken down into a high sugar, then that could even potentially be okay to still continue the fast if that would be enough to curb that uh, the hunger pains or the habit of having that breakfast in that time period, that could be something that could even be a gateway to then even potentially before you curb the breakfast side of that. Well, that still wouldn't be time restricted feeding though. It would just Got be, it. it would just be, mod- yeah. So, 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 so the goal is to be at least 13 hours with no food, black yeah. coffee, maybe a little heavy cream in there. Not, not a big deal. And then, and then try to do it longer and do it longer. Now it's easy to do if you're like busy and focused on whatever you're doing. If you're sitting around, not quite the same, not quite the same. And so I find my website when I'm typing, I'm just finishing up. I told you I was finishing up the, the next book on immune health. And so sitting there typing, I want to get it done. It's like, eh. I'm like, I want to eat. I got to get this done. I want to eat. But if I was outside in my yard or at the golf course, I'd be, I don't care about eating. Yeah. So, exactly. th- yeah. So speak to this for me. I, you almost already touched on it, but it's the idea of, it sounds like you said that, yes, when we eat a high calorically dense and sugar-based item, like a, a bunch of donuts, that we're going to then take that cell, pound it with sugar. When that happens, obviously there's going to have to be an insulin spike of some sort, right? Then there's also going to be an inflammation released. Now, a lot of times these people are uncomfortable. We had a question come in about, can by doing that, does that make your symptoms worse with the condition? And I feel like you answered that here just a few minutes ago that, yes, by being inflamed over a long period of time, certain people are going to have more pain with their muscle, joint, nerve, or disc-related pains than others. But if I'm that person and I'm th- trying to logically think this through and I'm not a nutrition expert, but if I'm thinking, all right, if I eat a lot of sugary foods, it pounds sugar into the cell, drops inflammation, sh- sugar in the blood goes up, insulin levels go up, and then if I'm also hurting... You would call that, if they did that over a long period of time and had some of those factors you talked about earlier, that'd be high levels of inflammation, right. okay? And high levels of inflammation, I don't want to make the leap incorrectly, but if I have high levels of inflammation over a long period of time, I would or would not gain weight? Uh, the, 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 well, you had to pound calories, right? Yes. Very few people... Uh, so 70% of the adult population is overweight or obese. And so it is the combination of chronically eating those calories plus gaining weight. Now, if you were to be a skinny person smoking cigarettes, like a skinny alcoholic who just eats donuts, but it's really skinny, they're flaming too, right? But for kind of a different, not because they're hypercaloric, because they're deprived of nutrients and most of their calories come from alcohol. So they're inflamed. But the average person is not that guy or gal. The average person is overweight or obese. And so pounding just a one, a drive, I call it a drive-by self-shooting, right? So you do a drive-by at Dunkin' Donuts, right? No one's looking, so you get a couple extra. You shove them in your face under the trees, no one's looking. And you're skinny and healthy, you feel fine, you're still going to have a flamey event after that, as I mentioned earlier. But if you do that over a protracted period of time, then every day you will start to drive up the flame even while you're thin because you're doing that. You're spiking it every day. Now, over time, now, you know how life is. So you weren't planning on gaining 10 pounds in March, was right? not on the to-do. Right on the to-do list. No, but COVID-19 shows up and, and then you were not prepared. You were not prepared for that stressor and 10 pounds comes on. That's how it is for everybody. We don't know when the stressors are coming. 
So you, so you condition yourself to eat these calories day in, day out, day in, day out, and then stressor comes, you become less active, you eat more of it, and so now you're eating the same pro-inflammatory calories, so you're driving up the sugar and the inflammation every time you eat, plus you're gaining body fat mass, driving up the flame every time you eat, and now you got a double hit going on. Every time you eat, you drive up the flame, and then when you're not eating, you're still flaming. And you feel like crap, and you want to get some pleasure out of life, and so what are you going to do? You're not going to go run because you can't run because you feel like crap. You can't go to the movies because you can't go. What are you going to do? Well, watch Netflix and eat some donuts at home. <laughs> right? Or so, popcorn so with that, M&Ms in it. I did that mistake recently. There you go. Good. Exactly. But see, it's yeah. good. The killer is it's good. If it's that good, how can it be that bad? Yeah. Well, you know, so so if you, because so, you're kind of in the Bible belt there, right? A little bit. The epitome. Okay, so 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 in the Bible, well, you know, and I don't know. Listen, I'm just as an observer. In the Bible, it says that cert, this this certain angel was sent down to Earth, <laughs> right? And so and so and so when you look at the Bible, it's all about dealing with temptation. So when you think about those calories, it may not be the good guy who is delivering those calories. Maybe a difference. So if you look at the Bible, right? And what does it say? So eat eat vegetation. Eat birds and fish, right? Eat those. It doesn't say wait till you know 1900 and get chocolate, right? <laughs> so it tastes really good. Lots of bad stuff for us fall into the domain of temptation that we should avoid. Yeah, yeah. So explain this. So you said all that happens inflammation wise. They're not exclusive is basically what you explained. They typically in the American diet come together. So you've got the increased calories, plus you've got the inflammation. Because a common question that we hear if the anti-inflammatory diet gets brought up um, is, okay, so I've got all this inflammation and I've got this weight gain. And if they're together, then if I take an anti-inflammatory, be it steroidal or anti-steroidal, uh, non-steroidal, shouldn't I then lose weight? No, it doesn't work like that. All that does is that so when you pig out and you're flaming away, so 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 you're you're obese and you're living on donuts and the flame is up. And so like right here would be say the threshold. I mean, I can't see my hand right now. Can you see my my hand now? You're the, barely the off the screen. Okay, so now I'm I'm below. So this is your flame threshold. So you're pigging out regularly and you now you live in the land of say symptoms. You feel like crap. You take an NSAID, you feel like this. You still feel, you, you don't feel like this, perfect. You just don't feel like this. Mm. So all that NSAIDs do is they suppress the flame for a couple hours, and when the NSAID wears off, you're back to the flame that you were at before you pigged out. So inflammation doesn't cause weight gain. Hmm. Weight, gain weight gain is inflammation. Mm. It's like, it's, it's it is, yeah, do you get that? You become inflammation. Your cells talk in the language of inflammation constantly. You can suppress it with the drug, but when the drug wears off, the language of inflammation emerges again and does not go away until you get your inflammation markers back to normal. Mm. So to explain, to think about it, to get a touch in the weeds real briefly, so you talked about all of that inflammation we eat with the sugar goes into the cell, right? If we think more whole body, if we eat a lot of those sugary foods, and Alan Bickmer just said, hey, are organic donuts okay? There he's, you go. He's yeah. one of our great strength You'll be and organically coaches inflamed. in the region. You'll be organic. organically inflamed. Hey, you look like crap, but I'm organic. Yeah, that's amazing. So we eat a lot of uh, organic donuts, Yeah. okay? You're now, screwed. You're screwed. So our body then... We're going to pound the cells with sugar. Now we're going to have a big insulin spike, right? The, the liver is going to respond in some way. And then to bail out the sugar in some way, we're going to add fat, which to bail out the, the sugar, I guess, or the inflammation level in some way. But the fat is the inflammation. I don't right know or way fat. off? I, I don't know about fat bailing out inflammation. It's just that it's just that it's just that the the lifestyle of a high calorie diet, which is mostly sugar, flour, and, 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 and fat, not sleeping, stressing, and not exercising, those four factors causes the body to progressively uptick the flame. Mm. 
And so you have to work on all of those factors to get your flame levels back to normal. And that is really all, all one needs to do. The problem with it is you think, well, I really have to do that. I mean, I don't want to do that. You know, I, and, and that means that you have no goal then other than eating. So you have to look at your life and think, okay, I mean, for me, I've got, I'm, 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 I'm staring the final third of my life in its face. So I've written four deflame books. I'm finishing up the fifth one basically by the, by the end of the weekend. And I want to write five more, at least five more before I'm done. So I got to keep my wits about me. Fortunately, I really like this information and it's fun and I learn. And so it keeps me interested. Plus reading about it and writing, I'm like, no, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. But even if it wasn't that, let's just say that I was good enough to be a senior tour golfer. Well, I wouldn't want to stop playing at 55. I want to be out there beating the 50-year-olds when I'm 65. How do I do that? I keep myself deflamed. So you have to have goals. There's this great, everyone should listen to Zig Ziglar talk about goals. You got to have goals. Ever hear, listen, ever listen to Uncle Ziggy talk? Hilarious. <laughs> Brett yeah. Winchester told me real early on about 2007. He's like, have you heard of Zig Ziglar? I'm like, hell no, I've never heard of Zig Ziglar. What, what kind of, who is Zig Ziglar? And that was one of the things that I ended up stumbling across. That's fantastic. So and those Ur that Ur know that reference, that was an incredible impression. And, and Ur Earl Nightingale, he was the guy who made Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, which is and it's all about goal setting, ultimately. And so, and so the human mind does great with goals. If the human mind does not have a goal before it, we are a mess. We're an absolute, absolute mess. So I will at times, like after I finish writing this book, I'll be like, done for a while. And I'll be sitting there thinking, man, am I, am I, am I, this is, what, is, what am I going to do? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll work in my yard and do other stuff, right? Plan other things. And then all of a sudden I'll get the bug. Okay, now I'm going to write again. So I'm back to writing. So I have, I keep trying to have goals, 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 because otherwise I'd be a big fat seaman and I don't want to be that guy. Cause, cause that's my future. Look at my brother, yeah. 340. I could be that guy. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that's the important thing. The take home from that is number one, you've got to set goals for yourself and they have to be attainable. And I love when you went and talked about that earlier, they've got to be realistic. You've got to set them and there has, you have to highlight the things in your life that are number one, the most important things that you are striving for. And the reason that you want to do that, you've got to get to the why behind what that goal is, you've got to set that and you've got to take it one day at a time that's reasonable. And one of the strategies we talked about tonight that was really great was the time-restricted feeding. You could eat the same foods, but restrict the time you're doing it in is a great first step to start breaking some of those habits. Um, David, and I and do and want thing, you to... Go ahead. Just, just anybody can do this. I mean, think of my brother. So, 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 so if they want to like watch... It's, it's, it's Tom Siemens diagnosis dystonia. He's got some YouTube videos. He talks about it. You can kind of look at his, 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 his blog, his website, and you can see he describes like, I mean, he was, he was 340 pounds on the floor, writhing in pain, right? Just like complete disaster. Couldn't exercise because of the dystonia. And he dropped 150 pounds. So if he can do it, or if people in wheelchairs who can't walk, and all they can do is curls and presses and some pulls. If they can shred, anybody can. Mm -hmm. That's it, brother. Man, I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight. I do want you to highlight one more time. Talk to me about uh, your website because I know there's been a ton of interest tonight, and I can't wait to uh, for everyone to go to the website. I've got that up now. Can you just talk a little bit about deflame.com because I have a personal bias towards uh, the book that's behind me. It's one of my favorite texts. It is a little dense, even though it's, uh, if you're ambitious and you really care, I feel like you can dive into it and get great information and then even learn some of the science from it. But can you just talk me through some of the options on the website? Sure. So, so, so the book you just mentioned, the original, you know, the deflame diet book, there's really one difficult science chapter, but it has to be in there because, I mean, how else can you explain? I couldn't make it any simpler without making it not, not real anymore. Otherwise, there's like, why? So like, what is good about fruits and vegetables? Well, they have these colorful substances called polyphenols and carotenoids. Pretty easy. 
So you just take it step by step. The other thing too about learning anything new, here's the thing that, that so so across the street from me, family has has a one year old kid. And she and 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 you have a child too, right? You've I have two, a three two. and a five year old. Okay, so 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 how do they they learn themselves? It's just fun. Say this, mama, dad, dad, and then what's this? And they learn the words. We used to have our youngest brother say the word truck when he was little because he couldn't say truck. He said something else that rhymed with truck. And we thought it was very funny, right? He didn't know what we were doing, but we just, and my parents were like, David, stop doing it. Mom, it's just so fun. Say truck. And he, he was, so, so little kids, <laughs> little, <laughs> little kids have no expectations with learning. Adults do. So if someone is very accomplished in any field and they pick up the book behind, they go, well, that's confusing. I don't understand that. Well, you thought you would understand it? Are you, are you kidding me? You know nothing about this. Of course, it'll be confusing at first. So you go through it a few times. But the basic stuff in there is really simple. Waist circumference, blood sugar, not complicated. So, so, so people shouldn't feel intimidated by not knowing something. I didn't know the stuff that was in that breast cancer book, I didn't know about all of it until I wrote the book. And I'm like, huh, I, I learned it. So I learned stuff. So that's how people should look at anything though it's a learning process. So the first book is about that. And I didn't put the, the weight loss secrets book in there with it because I don't want people to think it's just a weight loss book because it's a diet book for weight loss. Weight loss is a mental thing. And by the way, when it comes to like you know anti-inflammatory, you can do it as, as a vegan an omnivore or a keto carnivore. It makes no difference. You can do it all three ways, which is why I call it deflame because you can do it. It's, it's wide open for options. There's no like special rules like paleo, no potatoes. I have a friggin' potato. If the, if the Irish peasants who were very feisty and ornery compared to the more donut eaters over, over, over in France and the, and the bread eaters in England, you know, potatoes are fine. Right. So I don't have rules like that. The rule is get your markers normal. So the weight loss book is about the mental game. And the mental game is understanding the primordial drives plus how stressors impact the system. And so you learn that, you gain control. And so then the breast cancer book, I was gonna the second book I was gonna write was gonna be a female health book, and I didn't do that. So I just started I started working on it. I'm like, man, the breast cancer chapter is gonna be like hundred pages. So I just made it a single book. And then I'm like, I think the Kairos and the PTs need a book. So that's when I wrote the, the, the book about stopping your joints and muscles and bones from rotting. Because chronic inflammation is actually biological rotting. And so in that book, particularly in the Kindle version, it's all colorized. You can see what rotting arteries look like, what rotting tendons look like. So to have that visual image, it's like, well, I don't want to be a rotting. I mean, I don't want to have rotting joints. How am I going to regularly shoot? low 70s if I got rotting joints, right? So I don't want that. So those are the four books currently. And then there, 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 there is uh, supplements that are available. And then you can go to the top right, you can see you can click to the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. And I've got 10 YouTube videos right now, or 11, on COVID-19. And it discusses everything that people are not hearing in the news. Because in the news, all we hear about is wear masks, Stay, stay far away. There's even people in certain areas where they're wearing pool noodles on their head. So they go three feet out. Another person goes like, pool noodles in cafe. Really? That's going to stop all this madness? So face mask, pool noodles. Uh, I don't talk about that. I talk about all the biological, biochemical, nutritional stuff that will help people figure out how to deal with this COVID-19 thing because we're not getting healthy information from the media out there. We're all told we can't shake hands again from Fauci, and we can't be normal until we have a vaccine, all this other stuff. And it's like people are not given any uh, direction to have, to, 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 have, to have appropriate self-efficacy and mindfulness for their own lives. So that's what those videos, videos are about. And they can click through the various supplements and see well, how the supplements work and benefit the system. So that's kind of covers it. Brother, I think that's great. I can't wait to have you on again sometime. Hopefully you'll have us, um, especially to talk about supplements because the diet industry and the food industry is always such a challenge. And to be able to get some clarity on that because we've had some other great questions about that. 
my man, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. It's been a great night. We ran way over time wise, but it was just too good to stop. So we just hammered right on through it. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening. Cheers, brother. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody.